good morning. For some of you, I'm sure it feels a lot earlier than there, than others. And uh, thanks for everyone coming here. Uh, yeah, uh, my name is Michael Lin. Uh, my talk today is MacNarok, the end times of our workflows. Really happy to be here at Mac DevOps. Like Matt said, uh, uh, first time here was uh, two years ago, uh, very first Mac DevOps. And uh, it, it's awesome. Love coming up here for this. Um, uh, I am a client platform engineer, which is a lovely title that you've seen floating around these days, uh, maybe some of you. Um, basically means I get to make fun toys and tools for the back ends of managing Macs. Um, and as mentioned earlier, uh, I was really happy to be able to help Dropbox uh, get sponsorship this event. Uh, I think it's really worthwhile to support the community and make sure that information sharing happens and we all help each other out. Um, <coughs> uh, I go by a lot of different names. Uh, I have to do this in all my talks. Uh, Mikey Mikey on Twitter, uh, Pudquick on GitHub, uh, Frogger at the Mac Admins, uh, Slack. Highly recommend that you get an account there. If you don't have one, it's free. Just visit macadmins.org. Uh, sign in right away. And as Matt mentioned earlier, we've got a Mac DevOps YVR channel in there. You can pop in and uh, chat with all the people that are sitting right next to you. <coughs> and on June 12th, I will actually be starting at Facebook. Um, uh, so, <clears throat> Macnarok. Um, when I originally did this, uh, chose this subject, this uh, talk, uh, I had a very definite goal in mind, uh, sort of concept is end times of, of things that we know, like things are changing, everything's going to be new. I chose uh, Ragnarok as a theme because it's cool, like Norse mythology is pretty epic in terms of like end of the world story and stuff like that. But um, interestingly enough, when I was assembling this slide deck, um, uh, I went through a lot of time and effort to sort of create these connections between the story of Ragnarok and the story of things that are happening right now. And Honestly, I've had a little bit of a change of heart in the past uh, couple of days here, really, in regards to this talk, um, in that um, I don't want to depress everybody. This is like the first, <laughs> this is the first keynote talk out of the gate for Mac DevOps 2017 here, and I'd love to kick it off with a bang. I mean, we've got WWDCs kicking off in what, like an hour, hour 15 here. I mean, we're going to hear new toys, new cool stuff. You know, we're all working in the Mac world. I don't want to be up here singing like doom, doom, doom for like, you know, the next half hour here. I want it to actually be like you're a little bit jazzed about some of the things that are going on in the world without, you know, just putting this sort of gray thing over the whole thing. So I'm actually going to use my slide deck here as like some notes to hit in regards to what's going on. I still want to cover it. It's an important topic, but I'm kind of changing it right now because I think it's actually more important that the discussion itself actually happens, that the information sharing happens. I don't want it to be, uh, I want people to be informed. I don't want them to be, like I said, depressed. Um, so uh, the, bear with me a little bit here. Uh, the deck is in a particular order, but I'm not necessarily going to follow it. Um, uh, so, um, oh, okay, don't do that. Um, <laughs> uh, so. Uh, uh, the one thing that I did want to kind of bring to it, um, uh, the concept of Magnarok was that um, Ragnarok, the, um, the mythology, is an end of the world story. It's a story that hasn't happened yet. It's a story that there are signs and portents that will be coming forward saying, this is an indicator that the end times are upon us. And Magnarok, I found a lot of various things that I could bring together as indicators that Apple has got big changes in the wings. But we know that now. We've been experiencing that every year for the past six or seven years at this point. Every year is a big change for us. There's really honestly no difference in that this year than any other year. There's just some particular changes that I think that are going to hit the majority of people that are in this room and that might be watching this video or, or content later. Um, uh, Magnarok, uh, Ragnarok, the uh, concept is that um, uh, the Norse have a really interesting concept of uh, fate or destiny um, in that uh, there are people responsible for fate or destiny in the uh, Ragnarok mythology, which is the Norn, and they carve a path. They set where things will go, and the world uh, like water, it's, they carve it in the world tree, and uh, 
what actually happens in the world is water following that path, and it takes the general shape of it and reaches the destination no matter what. The end point is fixed, but what the experience is like along the way, there's a little bit of flexibility to that. And that's where I kind of went with this talk was initially the path I was talking about was not a very happy path. And I realized that there are, we can change that path. We can make it a little bit better. Um, it's, it's, uh, the destination will still be the same, but we can look at it differently and handle it differently. Um, the, the path that we're all on the march here that Apple has set, and uh, we're going to find more about that today with WWDC, is that uh, two of our long-standing gods that have existed in the Mac world community for the longest time are uh, the Golden Master Imaging Concept, or Thick Image, where you take an operating system and you bake into it all the things that are hard to do in an automated fashion. Maybe you've got an application or an installer that literally has a graphical element piece to it that you just cannot automate. And so rather than automate it, uh, rather than have a human sit at every computer that you set up, you build your image where you set it up once manually with a human, and then you capture that data into a disk image, and then you use uh, ASR to restore it onto your, every other machine. Do it one time, re repeat the end result, use it always. The other uh, god is a, is a newer god. It's a thin image, which also goes by the name base image or vanilla image, which is less about um, it, it, it's, it's, you don't deal with the problematic installers so much. Your, your real goal is, I'm just trying to wipe this Mac and get an operating system back on it. So you would use a tool like, like auto damage or something like that to just build what they call vanilla image where there's literally just the OS is installed and nothing else. And you're literally using it to install the OS because the OS installer for Apple sucks, it takes a long time right now. It takes like anywhere between like 25, if you're lucky, to like 35 minutes plus to install an operating system onto a blank hard drive versus the amount of data that's in a block level restore. It's only a couple gigs on like Thunderbolt or even over gigabit ethernet. You could do that in minutes if you just do it with a block level restore instead of letting Apple's installer kick off like every single time. And so the thin image God is the one where we're just using, we're, we're trying to follow Apple's rules, like to not bake stuff into the image and whatnot, but we still hate your installer and we want to do this a lot faster. Um, uh, Apple has been doing a lot of stuff as of late um, that is going to be sort of, uh, Ragnarok is the, the battle of the gods where all the gods die. And <laughs> uh, Apple has been doing a lot of stuff lately that these guys are kind of on the chopping block. Um, and you're like, oh, isn't this that imaging is dead thing? And it, it, not really, but kind of maybe a little bit is actually worse than that. Um, it, 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 so it's, it, imaging is dead. It, that there have been several really good talks on that uh, over the last uh, couple years for various conferences and whatnot. But a lot of them, I think, are given in sort of a, um, uh, an unconnected context. They're given in this context of, uh, uh, yeah, you're doing these things that Apple says don't do these things. You shouldn't be, uh, you know, uh, restoring an image of the operating system. Uh, there's better ways. There's DEP with MDM and blah, 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 blah and all these things that, that they're offering as, as alternative ways on here. And the people giving the talks are, are actually trying to tell, at least inform you about these alternative technologies for how to get a Mac set up out of the box. But um, they're not explaining to you that um, a lot of those talks aren't explaining to you why you should be investigating these things because Apple is doing X, Y, Z that is going to force you over to doing these things, which is kind of what this talk is a little bit about. Apple in this is, is the norm in this part. They're carving the runes into the world tree saying this is the path everyone must go. And they've actually been doing it for a long time. Um, uh, uh, Fimble Winter is the initial stages of Ragnarok, which is um, it's a series of three hard, hard winters in a row with no summer, spring, or fall in between them. And we experienced that collectively in the Mac admin community with 10.7, 10.8, and 10.9. Um, so uh, <clears throat> these, were, these were three operating systems that when 10.7 first came out, we all got kicked in the butt by these things. They were just so 
different from anything that we had before and caused so many problems. It was truly a winter. In Fimble Winter, it, it, there's, there's so much uh, just despair in the world that causes man to turn against man and everybody is just killing each other over what's going on here. I mean, Apple and 10.7, they ripped out, uh, they ripped out um, uh, uh, Rosetta, so suddenly your, none of your PowerPC apps worked anymore. They ripped out Samba, which finally was like for a while working with Windows file sharing and rolled their own thing, SMBX, that suddenly didn't work with anything. And, but but um, the runes that Apple's carving, it, it wasn't, it, that, that's like a side effect. Like the fact that it sucked was a side effect because behind the scenes, they were actually their goal that they've been doing this entire time, and this is the context that I think has been missing out of a lot of these imaging talks, is that they've been trying to bring up the security game on Mac OS, and the only way that they could figure out how to do that was to start iterating very rapidly and changing a lot of things under the hood. And so in that context, 10.7 had a lot of technologies that were introduced out of the box that were just completely game changers in terms of technology. Sandbox showed up on there. Uh, XPC showed up, which basically allowed you to take an, one application that had all these amazing powers and rights on your machine and split it into two pieces, where you had the administrative side that was very locked down and rigid and had all the power, but didn't accept end user input because end users are evil and tricky and they could do nasty things to your programs by typing in weird garbage to them. So you'd put that into a separate program that didn't have any rights. And if it crashed or died because someone was trying to hack on it, no bad, it didn't matter because they didn't crash and take over the super powered application. You used to get a separation of, of privileges on here. And uh, 10.8 introduced Gatekeeper. Well, it introduced the GUI aspect of it. The command line aspect of it, the SPCTL was actually introduced at in 10.7. Um, but the, the graphical, you know, only trust from the Mac developer dialogue or, you know, that, that dialogue, hey, you sure you really want to open this thing that you download? I don't really trust it. That showed up in 10.8. 10.9 uh, had local items. We were sold it as a bill of goods on iCloud keychain. But the reality is local items. If you don't have an Apple ID signed into iCloud on your machine, you still get local items. Local items is the iOS keychain model on Mac. It was introduced in 10.9, and it's only been increased in usage ever since then. It's basically become the replacement for where all the really, really secure stuff gets stored because the old keychain technology has just got too many problems. Uh, kernel extensions, they started requiring that those be signed. So in the, in the Ragnarok uh, uh, mythology, uh, after Fimblewint or after man turned upon man in despair and all those kinds of things, uh, the next thing that happened was the three roosters who uh, announced the upcoming battle. Um, <coughs> the, uh, the, the three roosters in this case were the following operating systems, 10.10, 10.11, and 10.12. Um, they went by names, uh, and you'll have to really forgive me here because I'm not a native speaker of this language, and so I'm going to try my best here. I'm sure other people do it better. Um, 1010, uh, the first rooster that crowed, Fjallar, I think, uh, is uh, crowed to announce to uh, the, uh, the, the giants, or we would think of them as monsters in North mythology, that, hey, the battle is coming, and, and waked up all the monsters. So 1010, um, the, the crowing that I'm talking about here that each one of these are doing, this is Apple going from behind the scenes security changes to like foundational security changes in these operating systems. So 10.10, total rewrite of the entire system that runs all the applications on your computer, Launch D. It's responsible for Launch Daemons, Launch Services. When you double click on an app in the Finder, it's the thing that's actually hosting the process and running it for you. They went from Launch D 1.0 code base, which was open source. You could look at what it was doing. Uh, every user that logged in got their own copy of Launch D that spun up and ran as them and all that kind of stuff to 2.0 in 1010 closed source. There has not been a release of the source of LaunchD since. It's actually folded into the libxpc project, again, a closed source library, because Apple totally rewrote the security system on the core process responsible for running all apps on the OS. And as they brought in XPC at the foundation, now there is one LaunchD process that runs, period, runs as root, and it uses XPC to compartmentalize the launch of like every other thing. 
total rewrite under the hood, but it changed the very nature of how apps are allowed to talk to each other because they're all gated now through this single process. Uh, 1011, uh, the um, Ulan Kambi, I think is how you pronounce that name. I'm honestly not sure. Um, uh, introduced SIP. Oh my gosh, if anything is crowing at you that security is now foremost in Apple's mind here for Mac OS, SIP it knocks so many people uh, down because they had workflows that Apple had been warning you, you really shouldn't be installing things into the slash system folder. You really shouldn't be installing things into the slash user bin folder. But people were doing it anyways, and then SIP came along and said, I don't care if you're root, you really can't do that anymore. Root was no longer king. SIP was uh, a level above root, and the holders of that gate was Apple. They said, this works, this is not allowed. Uh, 1011 uh, actually became the first operating system that the next operating system, Sierra 1012, right after it, uh, no longer required uh, an Apple ID to download. So that opened up the gates for automating the OS, just like on iOS. All you need is to have an iPhone, and the iPhone itself can get the next operating system when it comes out. 1011 introduced that capability. 1011 made it possible that the next operating system and the operating system all after that, you just had to have a Mac and it could get it for you. It's changing the OS distribution model once again. 10.7 moved it into the App Store. 10.11 to 10.12, that transition, moved it from App Store to more of a feature of the operating system, no longer an app that you actually purchase or download. If you look at your history when you go to download the Sierra installer, it's not associated with your purchase history anymore. You do not have a guarantee that you will be able to download and keep a copy of Sierra from the App Store for forever and ever. So I really recommend that, you know, kind of back up the copies that you've got right now. Um, 1012, again, with the, the theme of the crowing to the world, the battle is coming and all that kind of stuff. 1012, this, this rooster in, in, uh, didn't have a name in, um, in the Norse mythology for Ragnarok, but it had an extremely important role. This rooster crowed so loud that it woke the dead and said, come to fight. Here's the end battle. 1012, uh, as uh, Apple went from carving runes in the software of the OS to starting carving them in the hardware of the Macs that they were making. We saw Touch Bar Max launch with 1012. Uh, 1012 introduced the secure enclave processor. Again, security, Apple screaming to the heavens, security must be present on these Mac devices. And the SEP chip, which is the foundation of a lot of security technologies on iOS, made it into the laptops that a lot of people actually have here today um, and uh, unlocked po future possibilities of even more security-related controls. SIP Plus, I write that on here because uh, the, uh, system integrity protection actually, when it was first launched, uh, Apple kind of gave us a freebie. They added in all these whitelists of like, okay, we know you, you're not supposed to have this in the user bin path, but we know like, like 80% of you guys out there have done this anyways, like maybe a Jamf binary or something like that you've got on your, on your machine. We're gonna whitelist that path and we're gonna let you continue to try and install things there. 1012 actually went to those whitelists and locked them down, ratcheted them down, and actually removed things. Uh, 1011, when it launched, there were 400 plus um, uh, uh, launch demons and services in the operating system listed in a whitelist where you're allowed to use the launch control and disable those services. Like, oh, I really don't want NetBIOS to run on my machine because when the hell am I ever gonna use NetBIOS on my machine? You could actually disable it. As of, the, as of the latest version of 10.12, you actually can't stop or unload the NetBIOS service anymore. It's actually on all the time um, because the whitelist went from 400 exceptions down to like less than 40. And again, Apple is just ratcheting that security model and telling everybody, we need to get more secure. We need to get more secure. And then they added an APFS. So they announced it at WWDC as this is the next generation of file system. And it's a unification of the file system that is on iOS, watch, watch OS, TV OS, and now Mac OS. And they ship APFS tools and utilities in production Sierra. Like they announced it at WWDC saying this is like a preview technology, but then it's in every one of your laptops that you got here. It doesn't matter if you're running a dev build or not. If you're Sierra or later, you have APFS already on your Mac 
and you go to use those tools and they throw warnings at you. Hey, this is developer stuff. It may not be, it's not final. It could, it could be gone. But it just shows like how much they just needed to get that out the door and get it in front of everybody. Rich will actually be talking more about APFS later here. Um, but uh, again, uh, there's the APFS file system is the next generation of iOS file system basically backported onto the Mac for the most part. Uh, it has a lot of features that they had been patching and handcrafting onto HFS plus in iOS. Uh, it's just baked into the new file system on here. Um, and so again, I was talking about how I like kind of tried to like stretch a, a, a lot of the analogies here about Ragnarok versus Magnarok and all that kind of stuff. Funnily enough, like the last stage in Ragnarok is a, 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 a god named Heimdall blowing a horn in the halls of Valhalla. To in Valhalla, everybody has a big fight for the day and they all die, and then he blows his horn and everybody hops back up off the floor and we're all happy and we'll do it again the next day. Um, uh, in Val in Ragnarok. He blows his horn one last time. Everybody up, everybody up. It's time to get going. It's time for the battle on here. And there's actually, I mean, Heimdall actually shows up in the operating system when it went from 10.6 to 10.7. <laughs> they ripped out MIT Kerberos and they installed Heimdall. It was just like one of those things. I was like, okay, that's kind of cute. There's actually like a weird connection in here. But <clears throat> all, all that to be said, um, what is any of this having to do with imaging? The gods of imaging that I mentioned on there earlier. The statement that imaging is dead is not to be done in a vacuum. It is a process that Apple has been doing for six, seven plus years at this point, where they basically looked at the Mac OS roadmap and they said, this is, a, this is a security nightmare compared to the security story that we have on iOS. On iOS, we have secure boot. We have all these security features. We have a secure enclave. We have all these kinds of technologies that we are not present on Mac OS. And uh, 10.7, the reason it was so weird and so different to all of us was it was Apple saying, it's go time, we're, we're fixing Mac OS. And they've been working on it constantly this entire time. And they've been trying to indicate and hint, like these are the better ways to do things and be prepared and be ready for what's coming up. And uh, I, I, a lot of people, I think, have been just dismissing it because they're saying, oh, imaging still works. And it, 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 you know, I can still do auto damage right now with 1012, you know, with all these security changes. What does it matter to me? So. 1013, which is going to be announced today, is definitely APFS. Um, you will get upgraded when you install it. Uh, so <clears throat> um, how this relates to imaging is that up until this point, Apple has not provided a ASR restore tool for a APFS. That means all the things that imaging relies on, thick imaging, thin, thin imaging, the, the speed aspect of it, where we're not copying files. We're not doing ditto or rsync or something like that. We're just blowing bits from source A to source B. The ASR command line tool has no capability as it stands right now to actually do APFS at all. And Apple doesn't seem very inclined to provide us with that capability, um, which means that when APFS hits, what are you going to do? You could, you could use auto damage, and you could install the operating system 1013 to a disk image. You'll end up with an APFS disk image. What are you going to do then? You're not going to be able to get it back onto a hard disk on a machine. Uh, the imaging workflow that we're just using to basically wipe and put a Mac back to square one, when APFS hits, it's kind of dead in the water, guys. This is, not a, this is the part where that eh, it still works. It doesn't. It doesn't work with this. The way it is right now. Now, mind you, this, these facts are accurate for Another 48 minutes or so, so, um, uh, uh, or yeah, for 50 minutes. Uh, Apple could change it. They, they could totally change it. When, the, when they talk about the, the next operating system here, it could be different. But as it stands right now, when APFS comes out, nobody is going to be able to do uh, Deploy Studio, Imager, Casper Imaging, any of that kind of stuff where you have a disk image that takes an operating system and puts it on a machine, dead. And you don't have a choice in it. And it's not that this is, this is just a, a one-off. This is, this is an end path that Apple has been marching down in, in the name of security. Um, we, we just we don't have the tools. Um, there's some really cool reverse engineering that people have been doing as of late, um, figuring out the file system because it's undocumented currently. Um, so maybe a third party will step up and provide a tool. But um, we may have a year here where, where we just can't do it at all. And the thing is, 
in combination with this whole security path that we've been seeing, all these runes that Apple has been carving saying this is what will be, um, uh, the reason that we don't have a restore capability for it. Now, you can look at the ASR um, tool right now. It's linked against the APFS private framework. There's references to APFS internally within the ASR binary. Maybe we just don't know the magic incantation to make it actually work. But I'm not holding my breath because that thing I mentioned earlier uh, for 1012, the runes that they carved into the hardware, the secure enclave. Secure enclave, when you start looking at these steps and you combine them all together, APFS plus secure enclave, this actually allows Apple to do an activation-based OS install mechanism, which is what we kind of do on, which is what we do on iOS right now. It's a trusted boot model. It says, this operating system has not been messed with in any way. I, Apple, verify this individually for this unique device, and it's now signed and encrypted to this device with a key that is not extractable from the hardware. Secure Enclave allows you to generate encryption keys on your Mac that the private key, the decryption key, is not removable or extractable. So on an iOS device, the flash storage that's in that iPhone, when the OS gets activated and installed to the iOS device, it is married to a private encryption key in the iPhone that if you desoldered the flash storage on that iPhone and you took it over to another iPhone and soldered it in over there and turned on the iPhone, it won't boot because it doesn't have the key necessary to decrypt the OS that's stored on those chips. The same could potentially come down the pipeline for us, for Mac OS, which is the secure enclave would actually allow Apple to uh, in conjunction with your hardware, do an OS install, encrypt the install to a key that is stored on your Mac, and only that Mac will actually be able to boot that. If you take out the SSD uh, because it, you happen to luck out and don't have one of the ones where it's soldered into the board, you won't be able to actually like boot, mount, do anything with the SSD. Like They can bake this in at a level that, that even if we magically had a tool that APFS like we could do a block level restore from some third party or something like that. If Apple goes down the activation route, which there's indicators that they're looking to do this, it doesn't matter. You could clone bits from point A to point B to your heart's content. You're still not gonna be able to boot them because it's locked to the device. If you're using a product, for instance, that does imaging that's uh, uh, Thunderbolt, like uh, attached direct storage base, like you have a server that you just plug like eight different devices in and target disk mode and you install the OS. In the, in the set, like in the activation based uh, model, every OS that it installs, it just sees them all as uh, secondary hard drives to the primary machine and it could encrypt it so that, yeah, cool, we installed the OS on like eight different machines here, but none of them will boot because they're all encrypted to the key that's in the server that you were doing it with. So. This is the part of the story where I got a little depressed about the things that I was writing here, and I didn't really want to do like doom and gloom as, as, as a major thing on here. It's, you look at this and you go, I am a major organization, and I don't have the budget to buy a brand new Mac out of the box for every single employee that comes in. I have to reuse my hardware. I have employees that leave. I repurpose the hardware. What am I gonna do in this world where the OS install is not one that I can just automate by blowing bits onto a disk, uh, where every install has to be basically a unique snowflake, uh, snowflake of an install? Uh, what am I gonna do in that situation? The, I, I'm going from potentially a, a six, seven minute block level restore of data to the 25 to 35 or whatever Mac OS, and like you're, you're multiplying over your install process like three, four or five times over in terms of the amount of time that it takes and potentially be up against uh, GUI only interaction stuff that you just can't automate if, if for an activated OS install. Um, the, but then I went back and I looked at Ragnarok as a story and Ragnarok at the story is not just about the end uh, of times, of, of the death of the gods that you had, but it's actually a rebirth story. Uh, at the end of Ragnarok, uh, there are survivors, <laughs> and those survivors go on to build the new world. And what I wanna say here is, um, we need to get out the message to people that the uh, tooling that you're working on, I, I, there, there aren't enough people talking about 
how APFS will impact a very core critical process that we have imaging on our Macs. And I want the message to get out because I want people to come help work on the next generation of tools. Um, uh, Apple doesn't have a good set of next generation of tools. We're going to need to figure this out. Um, if you, again, if you don't have a Mac Admins Slack account, please hop on, uh, uh, contribute, whatever you can. There are other people that are saying that this is likely to happen. This is Deploy Studio's own account telling you that uh, system imaging will likely end with APFS. I mean, if you don't believe me here um, and you use Deploy Studio, even they don't think that, that you'll be able to do system imaging as we understand it with APFS. Um, that doesn't mean that it's the end of our automation workflows, though. It just means it's the beginning of a whole brand new batch of completely different ones, potentially, working under new restrictions. There's really cool things in APFS that I'm sure Rich will be talking about on here, like the snapshot capabilities and all sorts of stuff that I just start fizzing and buzzing, and we'll see these, uh, hopefully, with 1013 with, with WWDC, there is an APFS session where they'll be talking about, you know, what's new with APFS. Maybe we'll get some really cool tools. I'm kind of jazzed to see like what, what could potentially be done with it. Um, I just want to make sure this information gets out there that um, this year may feel a lot like 10.7 when it came out. Um, it will be hard, and, um, but we're all in the same boat on this one. And I, I just want to, to give people the idea that, that it, it's not the end of things, it's just the beginning of new things. And um, so uh, uh, with that, I really highly encourage you, uh, share, talk to other people, uh, ask them, uh, revisit what you're currently doing with your workflows. Um, are, do you have an OS install plus a series of packages after that? You may actually be pretty good off. Like it may, it, the, uh, it may just be that you don't do the OS install piece or you do the OS install piece slightly differently and then the rest of your workflow is pretty normal. Um, but uh, it's, it's not the end times as much as it is the, just the beginning of new times. And um, I really highly recommend sharing and, and uh, working on tools with other people. Anyways, <clears throat> thank you. Um. <clears throat> Questions? Wait for it, wait for it, wait for it. So are they going to be releasing Apple Configurator with Mac support? I made that joke and, uh, before, and I totally get where you're coming from. Um, and uh, oh, I, Except my joke was uh, iTunes. iTunes would install Mac OS, would be the next <laughs> one. Um, uh, uh, I really hope that's not the case. See, the, the, um, the, the, the problem is that um, Apple's uh, enterprise validation of their processes, uh, how to live and work and abide with the rules that they're carving into the world tree, we are that process. Apple doesn't have a process for figuring it out. We do. Uh, and so um, uh, uh, what that will look like, um, uh, I really hope that they, they don't do that. Uh, <clears throat> I'd be very sad to see that. Any more questions? Does this mean it's the end of open source on Mac? No. Um, uh, in, in that sense, uh, open source on Mac, see, the, the tools that we have, like, so it was SIP and then SIP plus. Um, uh, there was a little bit of flurry uh, not too long ago um, where uh, some conversation was going about, about Apple's going to take away launch demons. They're going to get rid of that on Mac OS. And the reality of it is that it's probably more along the lines of eventually the operating system will be so compartmentalized <laughs> that the things that you run just won't have the power to do what they did in the past. There will be, like the file system, if Apple signs the operating system, it's not that, okay, uh, they just don't whitelist the, the system fo folder paths or anymore, you just can't write stuff. That's, uh, they're gonna fundamentally change how the operating system is stored on the Mac, and in that scenario, you can't, you literally can't like inject files in there anymore. You can't um, uh, uh, put a tool in a place where uh, Apple didn't expect you to install something. Like open source may have less control over the operating system because Apple is taking a lot of control on the operating system. If we have to use MDM and DEP, I mean, 
Can we still use monkey? Has anyone told Greg about this? Uh, <laughs> uh, the answer to all those things is heck yeah, we use all those things. All those things are awesome. I know that we've got both uh, Victor and Jesse here, both uh, creators of two pretty awesome open source MDM products, uh, uh, micro MDM and commandment. Um, those are the things that Apple has been pointing towards, like the path of the future is like MDM will be how you manage your devices. So that part where I was really highly suggesting like dive in and try and help out, try and figure out the ways to work within the new guidelines that Apple's putting in here. Um, uh, working on those projects, by all means, please, those excellent, excellent projects to be involved with um, and, and are in the flavor of what Apple's been telling everybody to do. Um, uh, uh, Monkey. Um, I don't think a local agent is going away anytime soon until Apple adds probably about 5,000 more types of profiles to the Mac. Um, there's just so many things that we're currently configuring on Mac that you can't just do it with a MDM or a profile or something. Does this like mean I'm safe and I don't have to learn Puppet and Chef now? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, you know, it's a new OS release every year. It's different every year. Um, how rapidly Apple wants to move. They, Apple, uh, they gave some numbers out. They have a, a billion active iOS devices right now. That's active, like currently in use around the world. And then 80% of those devices are running iOS 10. So that's 800 million devices that are running iOS 10, probably easily 50% of which are running 10.3 or later, which means You've got 400 million plus devices out there that Apple roll upgraded from HFS plus to APFS. And I didn't hear any major screaming about it when 10.3 rolled out and upgraded other than it took a long time. You know, there was a couple people I knew that were like, okay, I had to do it like a second time or something like that. But it wasn't like a total screw up. So to have, you know, several hundred million devices successfully upgrade from HFS plus to APFS and that's out, in the wild right now, Apple has only grand total sold since the uh, introduction of the Mac, like 33 years ago. They've only sold like 190, almost 200 million Macs total. And I'm talking from, you, you count every plus, quadra, everything, all the way up to the touch bars that you've got sitting in front of you. That's 200 million devices total, and Apple has done easily twice that many devices in terms of iOS for the HFS plus to APFS upgrade, they're feeling pretty good looking <laughs> at the Macs that are out there right now. I'm like, man, dude, that's a drop in the bucket that's left, you know? And, and so um, they are, uh, uh, it, it's, they are, um, I think, feeling uh, that they are on the right path. And that seems, I think, to provide validation to them. Like we, we went to APFS on all these iOS devices. We didn't have major problems with it. We're doing the right thing. Let's do it on the Mac. Like they're getting excited about making massive changes to the Mac, and I don't think we're as excited as they are <laughs> necessarily. <laughs> but but I, I, how fast they go on it, I think will uh, uh, a lot of the the 10.3 rollout. How well that goes with APFS upgrades, how much people scream about it and stuff like that, um, I think will factor in to like how quickly things change. I think it's uh, pretty safe to say that we're pretty excited. So round of applause for Michael and. <laughs>